Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The Countering Foreign Propaganda and Disinformation Act of 2016 is coming soon, plus patenting censorship. But first, James, I noticed you tweeted out kind of a trio of stories a couple of days ago that all kind of centered around what is essentially science fraud. And I'll take the one that I think maybe informs not only the other two stories, but perhaps in some ways this whole episode of New World Next Week. And it comes via Nature, and their original title of the article was Survey Sheds Light on Crisis Rocking Research. More than 70% of researchers have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments, and more than half have failed to reproduce their own experiments. There are some of the telling figures that emerged from Nature's survey of 1,576 researchers who took a brief online questionnaire on reproducibility in research. The data reveals sometimes contradictory attitudes towards reproducibility, although 52% of those surveyed agree that there is a significant crisis of reproducibility. Less than 31% think that failure to reproduce published results means that the result is probably wrong, and most say that they still trust the published literature. Data on how much of the scientific literature is reproducible are rare and generally bleak. The best-known analyses from psychology and cancer biology found rates of 40% and 10%, respectively. So the headline of this article, James, that we grabbed from our buddy Doug at Blacklisted News, 40% of scientists admit fraud always or often contributes to irreproducible research. So, James, the two other articles get into misleading the public about GMOs and the Portland Public School Board banning books that deny climate change. James, what kind of brought you to tweet all three of these stories together? Well, I just saw the cluster of these stories and stories about um, uh, the, there was a British uh, doctor coming out and saying that low fat, the, the low fat craze of a decade or two ago was one of the worst mistakes in human health history. And uh, I saw you tweeted out recently a, talk, t- a story talking about health foods and how uh, healthy eating has been uh, just uh, all of the, the dietary nutrition guidelines that they put out for decades have been wrong, talking about uh, trans fats versus saturated fats versus polyunsaturated fats. And and I think this swir- circles around some ideas that are extremely important um, in, in the bigger picture, um, one of which is that I think that this story about ir- irreproducible research and the scientists who back it up, I think they have a point because this goes to the Thomas Kuhn's idea about paradigms being the operative um, paradigm (laughs) under which scientists work, which is, uh, well, yeah, as long as it's within this framework of what our current understanding of what the general rules of this uh, area of research are, then yeah, we might not be able to exactly reproduce this experiment, but we can explain it away because, oh, maybe this variable was a little bit different or that variable was a little bit different. So scientists are still working within a paradigm, and as long as they can conform their results to that paradigm, they can explain away to themselves, if if no one else, the uh, the fact that they can't reproduce their own research, which shows that fundamentally this isn't about reproducibility in the sense that we're taught that is the bedrock of um, experimental science. Um, but obviously, I think the bigger picture about this is a, the point about scientism and the way that people will see that that not just the headlines see this isn't just about the headlines people will say oh it's just head uh, headline writers making up sensational um, claims about research no this is the research itself is fundamentally there are fundamental problems there is a crisis going on here that isn't uh, seeping down to the public consciousness because again people will see scientists say blah 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 and they will internalize it and that's I mean that's obviously a problem because we are moving into the era of technocracy where we are going to be ruled by the experts exactly as Brzezinski was writing about four decades ago and Bertrand Russell even before that and it's this is this is a very bad thing for a number of reasons and people can see I think who have been watch, watching our uh, series here for the last several years, why that is, the, the various pieces of this technocratic uh, puzzle that they're putting into place, where we are going to be ruled by experts. So there's a lot to say here, obviously. I'm going to say it in my subscriber newsletter this weekend, so please do subscribe <laughs> if you want to hear more about this. I think it's an extremely important part of the, the bigger puzzle of this society that we're being crafted into, where scientists are always right, even when they're wrong. 
I'm glad you kind of centered in on technocracy because maybe that's kind of putting your finger on maybe what I, I couldn't quite explain of, of, I think, these group of stories that we're talking about this week on episode 271 of New World Next Week. And everyone did probably see that headline that said, science says GMOs are safe. But how the National Academy of Sciences misled the public over GMO food safety is included in this bit of stories. And again, everything that we say and mention on these shows is always included down in the show notes. And yes, the Portland, Oregon School Board promotes climate justice, bans books that deny climate change. So that's happening right here in my backyard in Portland, Oregon. But I think, again, to the heart of this technocracy that we're talking about, James, we'll take our second story this week via, I think appropriately enough, Russia Today, RT. U.S. lawmakers want federal agency to counter propaganda. American congressmen introduced a new bill this week aimed at creating a separate federal agency that would focus exclusively on countering Russia and Chinese propaganda, which poses a threat to U.S. interests at home and around the world. The bill, H.R. 5181, the Countering Foreign Propaganda and Disinformation Act of 2016, which is a companion bill to Senate Bill 2692, Countering Information Warfare Act of 2016, which was introduced back in March. According to Congressman Adam Adam Kinzinger, an R from Illinois, who co-authored the bill alongside Congressman Ted Liu, a D from California, H.R. 5181 seeks to incorporate a whole-of-government approach without the bureaucratic restrictions, which will set up innovative partnerships, doesn't that sound promising, James, to combat information warfare with organizations that have experience in countering foreign propaganda. The quote... As Russia continues to spew its dense information and false narratives, they undermine the United States and its interests in places like Ukraine, while also breeding further instability in these countries. At a time when countries like Russia and China are engaging in hybrid warfare campaigns, the United States has a unique opportunity to respond to foreign manipulation by encouraging the free flow of truthful information. This can further prevent conflict and ensure future stability. James, in other news, the BBC is putting up a statue of George Orwell at the entrance to the Big Brother Broadcasting Corporation. So we're trying to set up our own sort of ministry of truth here in the States, I guess. Looks like it. I mean, whatever else you can say about this, at least they're being open about it. At least it's out in the open and this is going to be some sort of official organization that um, will have some degree of transparency, but I, you know, both of our eyebrows raised at innovative partnerships uh-huh. and what that might mean, what kind of backdoor, you know, government uh, and uh, private business collaboration will go on in the forwarding of this counter propaganda. But still, as I say, at least it's it's out in the open. But let's not be naive as if there aren't operations that are not out in the uh, open that are going on right now to seed cognitive dissonance amongst various groups and try to uh, to put inject the the mainstream views in various places like comment sections of websites and YouTube and whatever else exactly as you were talking about the other day um, you covered a story on morning monarchy talking about the the Russian um, uh, troll force that the Kremlin hires to, to go online and do this exactly as China has the same thing exactly as the US and the UK and everywhere else have their same army of uh, troll commenters to go out and spread government propaganda and that's already taking place so this new layer is just going to be the kind of shiny outward facing version of this which isn't ultimately going to change the fundamental fact that there is already a great degree of influencing of public opinion going on behind the scenes. Um, So I'm not sure this will really change the game. But again, it depends on what they mean by innovative partnerships. Mm -hmm. And we have been talking about this for a long, long time, James. And that story that you're talking about, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but it's basically, you know, inside the Russian, you know, troll army guy basically says like man it's a job it was a quota to fill as though you were a telemarketer or anything else it was like i had to log x amount of comments and x amount of this in you know in an eight hour day and that was my job he had the stuff that he was able to type out fast enough and he was good at it he was good at quickly countering propaganda and being able to type really quickly and that's what they wanted they wanted forwarding his own pro the kremlin approved propaganda really 
That's right. That's right. So we'll include links to that as well, James, with, I guess, at least some sort of positive note as we're talking about Orwellian 1984. There is something coming up next week that is kind of vaguely defined, which maybe in a lot of ways is the best way for things to, to go. Something being called the 1984 Action Day coming next week on June 8th, which I think maybe as as Activist Post, I believe, says, I think you pretty much observe that holiday as you best see fit. So we'll move to our third and final story this week. James, as I was looking at the previous stories that we went over, again, I was reminded of something I talked about on the morning show recently that kind of maybe followed this out to maybe some extreme degree, but at the same time, quite literally kind of brought it home to what we all will kind of do, and that's listen to music and watch movies and things. Via business insider Apple patents technology to remove bad words from songs Apple's been granted a patent for technology that can automatically scan songs being streamed online and edit out any swear words in the lyrics. The patent, named Management Replacement and Removal of Explicit Lyrics During Audio Playback, was filed by Apple back in September of 2014 and outlines a system for detecting and marking explicit sections of tracks and then editing them to make them family-friendly. Apple says in the patent that the system could replace swear words with a beeping noise or it could use non-explicit lyrics instead. The system patented by Apple also describes technology that could detect the music behind the lyrics and simply remove the swear words generating background music so that the track continues seamlessly. James, this would be some whole other sidebar discussion about music is so robotic and fake that it can have an algorithm that can just, yeah, make up some background music in between. (laughs) But continuing, they note, as of course you know, Apple's patent isn't limited to music. It specifically mentions audiobooks as well. Apple could, in theory, edit out swear words or sex scenes in books to make them suitable for children. When analyzing songs or audiobooks, the system described in the patent would compare the lyrics to a library list of explicit terms in order to identify swear words. Now, there's no indication Apple's going to actually start censoring music on iTunes or its new streaming service, Apple Music, anytime soon. Beats One, I didn't actually know this, James, it's free online radio station, is already totally non-explicit edits of songs anyway. And Apple also patents lots of different kinds of technology, as lots of companies do, that rarely ever make it to production. And that's a whole other question of exactly why. Sometimes patents are bowed up to hide away that they fortunately never actually see the light of day. However, Apple is known to have strict rules around the kind of content it allows on the app. It gets into stories about, of course, how Steve Jobs would never allow anything connected to porn or a dictionary that had definitions for swear words in the app store, James. So, again, it's not like they're going to roll this out tomorrow, but the technology is there and it exists. So we take it to the full extreme. If they're going to bleep out bad swear words about sex and icky stuff in songs – Aren't they then going to follow that they bleep out bad, icky ideas about personal freedom and such? Yes, yes. Well, obviously. I mean, this is just another reminder, if any were needed, that if it exists in the cloud, i.e. on a remote server that is controlled by a small group of people, you don't really control it at all. The information is censorable and uh, in any way they they deem fit. Um, So... Just another reminder of that. And we've seen this phenomenon in various uh, ways over the years. And we know, for example, that there are um, ways to detect and if if they want to take down any YouTube video that has uh, a voice, uh, even a voice pattern that is recognizable. Um, For example, Joe Rogan and other people have uh, this service that looks for the sound of that person's voice on any video and will automatically flag it for uh, censorship. So we know these technologies already exist. They're just being kind of how how best can we use this and roll it out to the public in a way that's acceptable and all of that. So it's it's more about the the psi war at this point. But again, it's just another reminder. If you don't if they don't physically have it yourself locally, you don't have it. Um, And (laughs) tying this with a bow, we can, of course, move this back to the old uh, story from a few years ago. Amazon secretly removes 1984 from the Kindle. Remember, remember when people's Kindle, they, they bought 1984 and they had it on their Kindle and it was removed um, by Amazon and uh, just all uh, completely lost. That was an interesting little and very ironic little uh, incident that happened a few years ago. We'll put in the show notes so people can go back to that link. James, I, 
I, I wonder if another battle in this may also come when, I don't know if people remember, several years ago there was a, a, a company, there were a few different names, and I think there's even actually a documentary about this battle, a company that tried to make edited versions of films, and it was called like Clean Flicks or, or something to that effect. That doesn't go over well. And so in a lot of ways it might actually be the artists themselves who will come out and say, if you're going to be bleeping and changing and literally censoring my song, then you can't have any of it. And maybe that's the kind of watchword of what a lot of what we're talking about. You can't have any of it. James, a uh, little bit more good news, like the latest episode of Good News Next Week. Town saves thousands by unplugging their soda machine. $9,000 a year, to be precise. Also talk about Op Flint going on, where activists are giving water and supplies to the people in Flint and giving over supposedly run down motels to homeless veterans. I've also got stories, James, a fun one about the Madrid police dropping action against a woman with all cats are beautiful bag. The A-C-A-B acronym, of course, could also stand for all cops are bastards and Denmark to stop paying royal family members salaries. So, James, I don't know if you want to take any of those good news notes before I blast off with the last couple of notes we're looking at here. Fire away fire away. You're like, I don't want to touch any of that. <laughs> Some of the other stories that we are watching using the classic hashtag New World Next Week, and as we've noted, there are far too many to go over. And if you scroll down that list, you will get a pretty well-informed, well-rounded look at news going on all around the world. But a quick couple three. Venezuela dumping gold to avert total economic collapse. And caught on camera, U.S. Special Forces on the ISIS front line in Syria. And another thing looking ahead to next week, so not only the 1984 Day of Action on June 8th, but how about the super mega FEMA drill going on here in the Pacific Northwest, prepping for the nine-point Cascadia subduction zone earthquake and tsunami. That super mega drill is coming up here next week, James, June 7th, as they have been talking for quite some time that the Pacific Northwest is overdue for the big one. But until that happens, I do a morning show every morning on Media Monarchy and am listener supported. And that's how we roll, James. I hope you're taking swimming lessons and getting ready for the big one. Um, you know, that's a, 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 I don't know how to prep for something that is <laughs> a complete catastrophic destruction. I can know how to prep for, you know, no power for some days or no food or these in some sort of Roland Emmerich disaster movie scenario, I don't really know exactly how to prep for that. So. I don't know either. Um, you just got to be ready and prepared to uh, to break off from continental United States and drift over to Japan. But hey, you might actually finally visit me here in Japan. So 